<clears throat> well, good afternoon, good evening. It's approaching morning for some folks here um, watching live or on the program here. It's Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, and we are returning from our summer hiatus with our poetry barbecue. Our end of the summer, welcome back, poetry barbecue, where today we will have a lovely, lovely spread of poetry on the open mic. 12 readers, five minutes each. We get to the wait list, which we always hope we do. We try to be generous. We will certainly, certainly welcome more poems than up to the 90 minute time. I'm your host, Sandy Ano, and I'm joining you today from my new old hometown of Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And I want to say thank you so, so much to those of you who sent all the good wishes as um, my traveling companion and I were traveling across the United States to land here uh, in Connecticut. And I, of course, want to just give a big shout out to all my friends in the Pacific Northwest. Thank you for all the years. And of course, all the people we were able to visit with along the way as we made as I made my way to um, Connecticut, where we'll be doing the show from here and possibly from my dad's glass studio in the future, and hopefully some on location sites as we move through our fall season. Well, you know, this being the last Sunday of the month, we often don't have a program. We usually, take the last Sunday or two Sundays off. Um, we continue in our fall series with first Sunday will be our poet's focus. Second Sunday is always a new book showcase. And the third Sunday, as I'm sure many of you in the room know all too well is our wild card open mic. But we thought we would mix it up a little, come back for a little special event at the end of the summer and, you know, get the poetry juices flowing again. And hopefully everyone's had a, a powerful, productive, poetic summer and uh, wherever you live. And uh, also knowing that the seasons uh, are slightly different in different parts of the country, uh, different parts of the world. Um, so we really hope that this time has been uh, really generative for, for all of you, wherever you live in whatever time zone you're located. And we're just so, so happy to be back with you. And, and when I say we, I want to give, you know, all my thanks, as always, to Kim Ports Parsons, Don Krieger, for all the support, keeping the, you know, keeping the fire lights, keeping the fire lights burning. Well, you know, it's a barbecue. So right before the show, I made deviled eggs, which is a little delicacy here, uh, here, uh, you know, here in the United States, or I don't know where it originated. If anybody knows the or the you know the origin, put it in the chat. The other thing I thought I would mention uh, is that, you know, I imagine that some of you have been probably doing some reading this summer, and uh, I'm going to give a little shout out for a book that I picked up along the way this summer. And I really want to encourage you to in the chat here with each other and those of you on Facebook as well. We welcome you to the program today. Feel free to put in the chat what were some what were some um, significant books of poetry or about poetics that you that you've been connected to. And it, it doesn't have to be poetry. There's all kinds of ways that something you can read history, science, whatever can be feeding you literally uh, into your poetic process. But the book that I want to just mention that, that I've been fascinated with is a book called Poetry as Spellcasting. It's by editors Tamiko Beyer, Destiny Hemphill, and Elizabeth White. Um, and it's got like prompts, uh, it's poems, essays, and prompts to sing a new world into being. And uh, I'm finding it quite fascinating. So. As I said, folks, feel free here in Zoom or on Facebook, feel free to let us know what you've been reading over the summer and uh, 
I picked up far too many books in the bookstores uh, across the country, but that's all good. It's all good. And what's also really all good is our lineup for today. Wow. Uh, again, we're so, so happy to see all of you and very grateful. And Cultivating Voices, the membership on Facebook now is up to about 4,200 members worldwide. We know that many people, because they contact me individually, do watch the program on the video. And again, thanks to Don Krieger for just always so, so, um, so deliberately and, and so timely, always hosting the videos so that folks who can't be with us live here in Zoom and uh, live on Facebook are able to watch the program. We love that so, so many of our members are do that and um, we're just really, really grateful. Well, here we are folks. We 4,200 members strong, four years. And I remind you that we are a group that began at the, right at the opening of the pandemic we consider ourselves an intersectional, international, intergenerational poetry group. And I'm very grateful for all of the voices that we've heard over these four years. It's been quite, quite remarkable to be able to host this program and be with you many, many Sundays of those past four years. Well, let's get to today's barbecue, our Sunday barbecue, and a reminder that those of you reading today, uh, five minutes apiece. As you as you know, we're 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 not the tightest ship, but we're not the loosest ship either, and we want to get as many voices in as possible. So those first twelve, up to five minutes, if not you are leaving some wonderful space for other folks for our waiting list where you have the opportunity if you're on the wait list for one poem a piece. Well, first up today, it seems poetically fitting that a first reader would be a person from where I've just traveled from, Pacific Northwest poet, Ken Birch, great to see you and all those guitars in the background and Hello. I'm sure that you res Marcella Raymond is resonating with you and all her guitars as well. So so nice okay. to see you and uh, you know uh, you know hi to everybody out there and out at Evergreen and just fantastic to be with you today. Okay, it's good to be here. Everyone got a couple of things should be pretty short. Both of them. One is sort of a bit of automatic writing I did in the last hour half and it's kind of a meditation on the idea of fall and some things kind of metaphor for and so and so i and so i am and so i am here and so i now 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 in now in this now in this time now in this time of now in this time of now in this time of e life out of daily light that slips further out of daily presence 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 which presence which reveals presence which reveals that presence which reveals that previously present which reveals that previously unknown presence which reveals that previously unknown yet presence which reveals that previously unknown yet ever presence which reveals that previously unknown yet ever always always some always somehow always somehow sensed always somehow sensed within, always somehow sensed within each, always somehow sensed within each breathing, always somehow sensed within each breathing wounded, always somehow sensed within each breathing wounded child, always somehow sensed within each breathing wounded child, we always somehow sensed within each breathing wounded child, we were, were, were before, were before, during, were before, during, after, were before, during, after every, were before, during, after every moment, were before, during, after every moment, singing, were before, during, after every moment, singing through, were before, during, after every moment, singing through the worthy before, during, and after every moment, singing through the illumination, seen, seen, seen by, seen by, and seen by, and in, 
seen by and in every seen by and in every word seen by and in every word on seen by and in every word on any seen by and in every word on any page seen by and in every word on any page or seen by and in every word on any page or screen clear or blurred. And the second one is just a poem I wrote earlier in the summer. Harvey heard this one before. So uh, I will just do a, uh, a trigger warning that it offends a public figure who deserves to be offended. It's aimed solely at that figure uh, who made uh, some horrible accusations about people. A loving plea to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Stop tranquilizing children. Stop bullying children. Stop under school fundizing children. Stop Christian nationalizing children. Stop fashionizing children. Stop fascistizing children. Stop militarizing children. Stop imperializing children. Stop curiosity destroyizing children. Stop mindless conformizing children. Stop suburbanizing children. Stop white supremalizing children. Stop capitalist systemizing children. Basically, in short, stop dechildrenizing children. And while we're at it, Start inclusionizing children. Start respecting things said in confidizing children. Start restoring the sense of safetyizing children. Start listening to and contextualizing children. Start honest historicizing children. Start fully democratizing children. Start preparing for liberationizing children. Start celebrating the beauty and potential of the futurizing children. And if you don't like it, Marjorie, go sexualize yourself. Thank you. That is Ken Birch telling it like it is. Thank you so much, Ken. Yeah, there you go. That's it. That is it. Oh, you know, I love how you run a line. You're the, the way that you create a poem is unlike any other poet I hear. And I am so glad to have you open up our poetry barbecue here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Um, we now move next to, I love that this is Ann Tweedy followed by Marcella Raymond. It's just like being on the road with you back in, back in Vermilion. Uh -huh. It was so wonderful when you stopped by Sandy and it's just so great to be with you and, and, um, Kim and Marcella and Don and everyone today. <clears throat> I just have two, two poems. I I don't think I'll go the, the full time either. Um, this one is called Light Ship. My dad gave me his car before he died, a 2008 escape. It takes me places he wouldn't go, like this cabin at the Buddhist center where I meditate instead of pray, or the cross country trips he didn't take because his homebody wife held him close. When I last visited Massachusetts, the car went north to Maine with me on a lark because internet articles promise the best lobster roll. Not bound by precedent, it takes me on kayaking trips, though he never canoed after remarrying, much less kayaked. It goes to the movies and could visit a gay bar if I could find one in my new state. When I'm en route to a place he might have liked, state park or wildlife refuge, I think of how a tiny piece of him is coming along, of how he inadvertently carts me around, although alive, he often stranded me. In life, he felt constrained, others' wishes, imagined shoulds, religious strictures. Now, in a way, he's free, and his car is part of what makes me free, and freedom is everything to me. You. And then this next one is called Bird God, and it um, uses some Lakota um, stories that I, I read about on the internet. Um, it has a Lakota word, Wagnuka, which is the red-headed woodpecker, which I don't think I'd seen until I moved here to South Dakota, but it's very a very striking bird. Bird God, one, walking riverward to the Missouri, red-headed woodpecker, Wagnuka eludes me, flash of white and black that I first mistook for wet, for magpie, though rare in my new state. Two, all through the country, they, sorry, all through the county, they catch insects along farm fences and in fields, leaving quickly if you approach by bike or foot, a mysterious brightness. Three, 
but more plentiful among these groves near the river. Out here, you can see their red heads from afar as they land on snags or high up in live trees, even on dead boughs along the banks. Always too fast to get a good picture with my long lens, the modern version of Audubon's long tom. Four, in the old days, farmers offered bounties for their bodies, but here on public land, Army Corps flood control project, these woodpeckers are the masters. The orioles, red starts, wax wings, warblers have to fend off Wagnuka's theft of eggs and nestlings. Grasshopper, grasshoppers may at any moment find themselves stored live in crevices. Humans must adjust to the knowledge that they may never get a good picture. Five, Wagnuka, who gave the Lakota the flute so long ago, showing the young hunter how wind through beak drilled branch makes music. The hunter returned to his people without meat, the elk having gotten away, but happy. Wagnuka, who visits only to breed and who nomadic may be uncommon next summer. I supplicate for glimpses of your gorgeous contrasts, marvel that despite the felling of dead trees and creosote in telephone poles, you dazzle bland sky. That was Antweedy, everyone, from Vermilion. Again, wow. You know, the first poem, of course, I couldn't help but, you know, having driven all across the country, you know, really spoke to me about the whole idea of what it means to get in a car and particularly a car that has that kind of history. And we saw all kinds of cars like that on the trip. Um, the names of cars are really interesting. You know, the poet Marianne Moore worked for Ford motor company at one point and her job was to name cars that she was hired to do that that's amazing that's amazing it's amazing so um you know i think about the names of cars and think about like yeah they 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 can be metaphorical and that second poem of course wow that, that, Kim and Kim has a real penchant for birds, and I know she's with you with that poem. And I do want to put just one quick plug in again for that, because you mentioned the Lakota. I want to put in a, 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 a I want to put in a plug for this film we saw with Anne sitting right next to Anne and Marcella in Vermilion a couple of weeks ago. Lakota Nation versus United States. If it comes to your city here in the states, I hope it gets. I hope it goes worldwide. Uh, please do make a point to see that film. And if you want to reach out to me, or I'm sure Anne be happy to talk with you about it as well, Marcella, uh, let you know a little bit more about it. Uh, it's much, very, very worth uh, seeing. Thank you so much, Anne. I hope you're doing well. In my heart always, as you know. And I'll talk with you very soon. Well, next, literally her neighbor. And I know because I've been in the neighborhood now. Marcella Raymond. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. And I, I see my clock there. I see the clock. clock. I'm, I'm going to get something to show you. Well, well, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, and I, I just want to share Anne's gratitude that you were able to stop. I feel so lucky that we got to hang out with you guys for a little while. And um, yeah, and I wanted to share also what Anne said about Lakota Nation versus the U United States, that the poet Laylee Long Soldier is kind of the narrator of the film, which is, and the poem that she uses to narrate the film is really stunning, just stunning. So yeah, um, I have two short poems. Um, and this first one is definitely a barbecue poem. It's called, She is Never Enough. She is a testament, a monument to the comforts of her kitchen, to bad meds, faulty joints, too much breast milk or not enough, to corn and soybeans, long still winters, to slow metabolisms, abusive fathers, friendless childhoods, romantic betrayals, media conspiracies, patronage, to wild gene pools where breaded pan-fried fish 
swim in currents of heavy cream. Oh, the potlucks where her breasts, those banners of bulk, announce her arrival, where even as she reaches the table with a Velveeta and tater tot masterpiece, parts of her are still arriving. Oh, her thighs, their friction sparking brush fires in the grass. She, a walking delicious backyard barbecue. Oh, her footsteps or dancing tribal rhythms that beat our hearts for us. Let us celebrate the plenty of her, the enfolding, the enveloping, the subduing of glass sharp angles and uncomfortable jutting ribs, the quashing of size two. Let us give thanks for the cornucopia of her, overflowing abundance and radiance, her body in constant undulating motion, her beauty too splendid, too generous, to fill only one cup. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and this second poem um, is not strictly a barbecue poem, but it does have fire in it. <laughs> so close enough. Um, this is called Olympus Ablaze. Few remember the younger sister of Zeus, Photia. She was the mother Rhea's favorite, of course, the way she could light up the mountain. Dad Kronos wasn't a fan. All that ashes to ashes business could undo even his perfect timing. Like her siblings, she had a temper. Each time the boys tied her to a stove pipe, each time they put a mop in her hands or tried to crawl in bed with her as horny teen gods were always doing, she'd torch the place. You don't see her name in history books because like so many rebellious women, she's locked in Hades underworld, out of sight in a dank fireproof room where the only thing she has to burn is herself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcella, for you. <gasps> yeah. The marshmallows. <laughs> nice. And also, I wanted to just, there's somebody that would like to say hello. <laughs> there's Zesto. Andy, you're muted. Yes, thank you. Yes, I was going to say, you folks are bringing it today to the barbecue. That's for sure. Here's some marshmallows. Here's Zesto. Well, we next. I'm so grateful to see my dear sister from many, many time zones away from here, where I am, Alexander Zarapalu. Thank you. And I, I want to just mention that when we get to be in the presence of Alexandra, uh, the, the gift of her poems comes with these amazing, amazing visuals often, and they are a labor of many months in the making. And I'm always grateful when you come to the program and share them with us. So welcome and thank you for being here today on our welcome back of barbecue. Thank you. I, I won't enlarge on. So um, you can see the graphics going by, right? You can see the graphics. We've got them. The, yep, okay. we've absolutely got them. Okay, I won't enlarge on because then they'll get stuck. Um, flying 17. This light is mine. It is hyperphysical, illuminating in the golden tenderness of a poetic heart, discerning and choosing amongst inherited traits of Zeusian cultivation and Cronian egoism, along the exploration of an inner dialectic synthesis, indulging and abstaining desecrating and purging, endeavoring to optimize 
our emotional mindset, attempting to restore ourselves and our earth from polluting elements, our burnt terrains, our mountain tops, haloed by rose dawns and rose dusks, bridging the gap between immutable firm ideals and capricious shady senses. On auroral mountain tops, enslaved worms transforming into quivering, resurrected butterflies, goldwing after goldwing. The stone is mine. It is releasing, leaping in the contemplative homage of a philosophic mind, intuiting and electing amongst dynamical antinomies of clear-winged visualization and cyclopic blindness. Along the mission of a diamorphed Dedalian inventions, upheaving Minoan waves bursting forth from a pyroclastic flow of Aegean DNA. Frontier warriors anxious to restore our eco-formations. Our lands, our seas, our seven skies, seven times blue. Adjusting to natural and supernatural cosmic purposes. Our goes bow, breaking into a sky sea of orgone, silver wave after a silver wave. This union is mine. It is aura bonding, intensifying in the fiery sovereignty of an ascetic fulfillment, filtering and selecting amongst labyrinthine channels of persephonic magnanimity and Tartarian beastliness. Along the polymorphic emeralding, of each individual unfolding. Lion hearts and lion minds emancipating from lower and middle ranking hierarchies. In joyous exemption from demons and delusions, from resistance and time. Evolved phosphoric suns activating towards the east Devolved dim spheres deactivating towards the west. Delineating photodynamic and aphotic positions in dimorphic order. Sun-born unrestrained vibrancy dawning into our caves. Luminiferous ether dazzling, vivid flame after vivid flame. This truth is mine, it is envisaging, polyvibrating in the vivifying fountain of pan-human axioms, clarifying and correcting amongst antithetic consciousnesses of trained logos and untrained themos. Along the reshaping of each new age, aspiring to rise into advanced halcyon apogees formed by prime pan-universal rearrangements. Superpositioned apotheosis, sending exalting potico philosophy to torchbearers. Eris's nostalgia, tuning into the eurythmic heartbeat of thriving, ascending astric galaxies. Balancing on a symbiosis of cataclysmic and epiphanic laws of creation. Dodecahedron galaxies overflowing with humans and gods, reaching the borders of zenith beyond after zenith beyond. This sweet flying is ours. It is absolute. 
emblazoning in the progression of the idea, the panfiery great idea. Thank you. Wow, that is Alexander Zarapalu, friends, from the Flying Series 17. And I'm a little out of practice and I'm going over in my comments, but I just have to say that <clears throat> there's, the, there's the poem and of course there's the visuals and I'm really noticing the also the evolution in the process of your visualization was what also really, really struck me today. There's been a, the poem is so transformative in its messaging. And I'm hearing that and witnessing how I'm watching those visuals that I've been seeing for many, many, a few years now, how those are evolving and transforming too. That was just so beautiful. Thank you for bringing it to the program. It really spoke to me today on so many vibrational levels. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I don't know if it was sizzling, but we were definitely sizzling here this summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, may you have relief within the light, within the light. Thank you. My dear friends, we move next to Joanne James. I'm looking forward to hearing what you're up to, my friend. I'm going to blow a few bubbles for you. Thank you. I am <clears throat> taking walks with N95s. We've had smoke from Canada, the Pacific Northwest, but <clears throat> I was really looking forward to this. And I'm kind of hoping for the end of the sizzling soon. Our, our weather's been better, we haven't. I want to, um, if you could see this, it's uh, no, pathetic literature, Eileen Miles. And I asked for it for my birthday in January and it's still my favorite book of the year. And I um, did a online, um, I guess a workshop where she gave us a, um, exercise so we could write our own pathetic literature. And I, I'm not going to go into that right now, but you really should look into it because it's um, kind of explode, blows your mind. Uh, one of the things she, we had to pick, it's kind of a, a cut up, I'm going to read called the corsage. And there are different times in my life that just seemed what she considers a pathetic but pathetic, so pathetic, it, it's good that you must share it. That doesn't make sense, but you could look it up. The corsage. When I'm just being myself, like an infestation of ants, an avalanche of winter, one hand on the steering wheel, eating McDonald's French fries with the other, hit an ice patch on 81, free fall, spun out, spinning, 360s, the french fries orbiting inside the car. After we had driven three hours to Rochester, she refused to go into the house. A friend from college sent a wedding invitation. Then I left my husband, so I asked my new lover, Sue, to go with me. She wore a suit and tie. Instead of going to church in the morning, we drank Mary Magdalene's in a gay bar. Julia Vinograd wore a funky purple velvet beret with a big pin on it that said, weird and proud. When I became ill, when I had to dredge the depths, my mother sent a huge fruit basket to cheer me. There was one blood orange. My lover took it. Hiding out in a world made of money, living with illness that never goes away. I believe in angels and aliens. Every Saturday at noon, we watched monster movie matinee, creaky, spooky music. Igor sitting by the fire introduced the movie. Everything an avalanche of winter when I was born. 
Remember the christening when the baby wouldn't stop crying? My, my Greek in-laws thought I had given her the evil eye. Baba's wearing black clustered around her, made the sign of the cross with olive oil on her forehead. In a cluttered bookshop near the hate, Julie Vinograd is blowing bubbles from her ubiquitous bubble jar. I'm spellbound by her rings, one on every finger, and all of them eyeballs rings against the evil eye. In the reception line, the bride took one look at Sue, then glared at me and turned away. Sue and the photographer sat at the bar getting drunk on screwdrivers. He forgot to take pictures. After high school backpacking in Europe, I became obsessed with the corsage I'd left behind inside my suitcase. I envisioned black mold and ruin. It was the reason I cut my trip short. Tall, skinny boyfriend with booze on his breath, nicotine stained fingers, showed up at the gate with a corsage, presented it to me like we were going to a prom. I'd only met him one week before at the Grape and Grog, and he told me he wanted me to meet his mother. The scale model of Monster Mansion decaying over the years. The corsage was intact when I got the, back to my suitcase in bourgogne jaloux I never saw that boyfriend again. Back on Bear Road, my father told us we shouldn't get jobs because we had the rest of our lives to work. I hate being introduced to someone I've already met. Then I have to blurt out, we've already met. Why don't you remember me? I remember you. Then something really awkward occurs. The person usually avoids me after that. It's like I gave them the evil eye or stood there sucking blood oranges. Then I long for that feeling of stepping hard on the brake and a new foot of snow sliding out of control. Big donuts in the parking lot and Blondie rapping eats up cars on the dashboard radio, watching my girlfriends in the rear view mirror laughing their heads off. Thank you. Pathetic literature. You look it up. It's <laughs> well. You sold me. You sold the copy to me, for sure. I mean, Eileen Miles is one of our, you know, international treasures, of course. Amazing, amazing voice. And how weird that I chose to blow bubbles before you read, and the bubbles show up in the poem. There you have it. Very good. That's Joanne James, everyone. And yeah, no more fires, you know, no more smoke. It's, it's, you know, it needs some relief for breathing, for breathing. I hope you, you know, send some energy your way for that because I've been there and those summers are, those are difficult, difficult days and nights. The, the sky, doesn't even look like the sky we recognize. The sun doesn't look as if it's a sun that we recognize. Um, so take good care of yourself out there. And I like your glasses a lot. <laughs> All right, I gotta move the program along now. <laughs> oh, maybe I've been on hiatus too long. I'm a, maybe a little too lax today with everybody. All right, my friends, up next. Uh, so enjoying the program today. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's just an absolute delight to be with you here for our, our Cultivating Voices live poetry. It's our welcome back reading and we are welcoming now to the stage, the artful Dodger himself, Harvey Sauce. Great to see you, Harvey. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, first poem is one that I put, I hope, the finishing touches on a couple of hours before this started. It's called Slave Ship Alabama Epigraph. Advertised for sale in 1860. Negroes with strong backs and all their teeth. 
with a wasp's nest of mud built up around it, the last slave ship bound for the Americas, the Clotilda, having made the trip to and from Africa on a dare after the US had banned further importation of the enslaved, lies just off the Gulf Coast of Alabama in the vicinity of Mobile Bay. A surprisingly well-preserved two-masted schooner waiting to be upraised like elect Christians on Judgment Day, when the saved shall be separated from the unrecyclables. With the fate of those engaged in the slave trade, cotton growers who would climb to heaven on slave labor's backs, depending in large part on whether the God who awaits them is more Old Testament than new, an eye for an eye kind of guy. If so, they can look forward to an eternity of picking cotton bedeviled by weevils ceaselessly packing the plant's soft soles into bales with their own torn and bloody hands, as justice demands. Exodus 21, 16, suggesting, on the subject of stealing and selling a man, it's not the same as trading in horse flesh. Words to that effect, a seeming bar to resurrection. Tim Meher, the Clotilda's owner, and William Foster, its damnable captain, could attest to this if dug up to answer a few questions at a revivalist meeting of the damned. Kingdom come for such as these, not known to boast that plantation lux associated with Elysian fields, assuredly not for slavers claiming first dibs, keeping the choicest captives for themselves, as Meher and Foster did before auctioning off the rest. Burning and sinking the wreck and its bilge pumped offensiveness, intent on muddying the waters and the evidence. And yet the truth lies there for all to see, scuttled without sentiment 10 feet below the surface. A reminder of what we have been and what we might be. If tourism can fund its retrieval, the remains of that Clotilda may find new life as a centerpiece, a conscience of sorts, for a cautionary museum intended for Africa Town, Alabama, where survivors settled after being freed. And wouldn't that pin a donkey's tail on the ass end of secession? Shifting our attention away from a colorless Confederacy, its stars and bars nasty as a NASCAR grease rag to the starry night colorfulness of Van Gogh's Impressionism. Was it a checkered flag that set the so-called master race on such a course, lip syncing its responsory of state rights? Upriver and just offshore, the chains that secured that last batch of Africans to the hold's rotted timber, all 110 of them, still rattle in the night. And the second is a much shorter poem called Before We Die. If CPR doesn't work, jolt us with the enormity of our overdue book fees. Slap on the paddles of those streaming series we've been meaning to view employ the shock value of a stock market plunge to prime the old pump until the blood runs away from acquiescence in its own demise. Don't waste your pennies on our eyes. Numismatists say they might be worth something one day. Fill the hospice ward with revivalists. Take in vain the names of the many rock guards who've overdosed and flamed out, rekindling with flint and stick some faint spark of hope our doctors might have missed. Before you settle us in hospice care, tell the attendings that if they can jumpstart a dead car battery in the parking lot, then damn sure they can jumpstart us. Just try a little harder, please. Put their backs into it. Beat us like a drum, pound our chests without fear of breaking either heart or sternum. Signal success as a crossing guard might the stop and go traffic of Sisto diasto. And should the language of our vital signs remain unintelligible, speak your practiced farewells, nothing too embarrassingly religious, giving candy stripers first crack at any flower arrangements left for us. Thank you.
That is the unequivocal Harvey Sauce. Thank you for joining us today on the barbecue. It's so good to see you. And you. Um, of course, please put, not just you, Harvey, but anybody, please put in, I'm always reminded when Harvey reads because Harvey is also the curator of a consummate reading series. And if uh, please feel free, of course, today, folks, share your upcoming readings. We've been on a hiatus. Let us know in the chat what's going on. Um, in your areas, and uh, particularly if they're Zoom events where we can partake and participate. But uh, anything you want to share about what's going on in, in your area, your sphere of poetic influence, please do share that. And of course, thank you so much. And Tweety mentioned, it, you know, what a, what a, what a significant, significant research of history to be able to bring through that poem, that first poem, Harvey. Um, and I have a penchant for also, you know, using history as the as the as the way to break open truths and 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 truth telling and really appreciate that today. Thank you. You're welcome. Well our next poet again I was saying earlier in the pre the pre-show uh before we gathered uh, it's just so, so, um, and so feel so humbled having crossed all the way across the country and seeing people. And I really, really miss people. I really miss the connection with people in Ireland over the, over the course of this summer. Um, and so I'm just really grateful for those of you who are joining us tonight from Ireland, whether you're here in the room with us in Zoom or, or, um, uh, when you'll be watching the 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 videos of, of the recordings of today's program, so thank you so much, Cathal. Looking forward to hearing your work tonight. Welcome. Well, hello, uh, Sandy, and uh, no, you weren't alone. We were following along with your adventures as you crossed the country, and welcome to the retired member circle as well. And I hope you have a long, happy, and healthy retirement. And thank you, everybody, for uh, reading your poetry. I enjoy these evenings, I tend to sit back and listen rather than write or type. I, I find if I try and type, I miss the next poet's reading. So I, I tend to want to just hear what people are writing. And uh, as always, it's been very enjoyable. Two short poems for you. First one is called The Spanish Fantasia. That I might lose myself in sleep and be carried on wings of forgetfulness to a safe place where I would shelter from the heat of the sun and bathe in the silver of the moon. Then lie beneath the citrus musk of an orange tree in the Jewish quarter of Old Seville. And later, as that Madal Kavir shimmers darkly on her way to the sea, the black bulk of a Spanish galleon moored by the quay is gossamered in the threads of the moonlight like a spider's web. Then I taste again in the long morning heat, those soft Moorish cakes with nutted cream cinnamon soaked in honey that sticks like auburn tar to the tongue. And my second little sharp poem for you is an elegy. Uh, on the 26th of July this year, we lost one of our greatest singers here in Ireland, and we are still mourning her, and uh, she's left us a great uh, le legacy of her music. She's called Sinead O'Connor. And there's an elegy for a songbird. The testimony, uh, testimony of a broken heart trying not to die was no way to live. A songbird in a cage right from the start through pain of loss with so much love to get. Her voice broke through to soar among the clouds, an honesty that cut through all pretense a rebel heart that raged before the crowds, impatient to be free of all nonsense, that religious hypocrisy might show of the denial of her own free choice. An uncompromising life was her vow, a songbird who'd always known her voice. Her vulnerability was too raw, too much of her exposed for public show, bleeding upon her cross for all to view, more than any human heart should allow. There should have been a safe harbor for her, a private life away from public sight, 
where those who loved her might shield her from harm, though hurt in her could not move to the light. Yet she stepped to the edge of the abyss and dared to seek to touch the form of all of music and song sealed with her kiss, then slipped beyond us, beyond our reach, beyond our call. So that's it. Back to you, Sandy, and uh, back to everybody looking forward to the rest of the evening. How am I good? Thank you so much, Cathal. Like, and I, as with so many of us um, over on this side of the pond, Sinead O'Connor's work, I, I you know, I, I remember the very first time I heard her voice. And of course, I saw that iconic episode of Saturday Night Live, and I've never mm. forgotten that. And just the way that, you know, whenever I listen to her, I just, I, I do feel really transported um, to a very different place that I don't get to travel too often. And I'm just really, she is a true, true poet and, you know, an activist, you know, she's, an activist and she did her work about as well as she could in the face of um in the face of a, a lot of misbehaving is the word i'm going to use and in the face of a lot of misbehaving around her so thank you for not at all not at all i i think if i might finally say i think the word is fragile that many described good work were. And I think every generation we have artists who are too fragile for the cut and thrust of, of um, uh, celebrity and the falseness that brings, you know, the Grammy Awards where you're linked in just in numbers and it uh, there, there's a fallacy there, but you have to be strong to handle that. But anyway, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everybody. And I look forward to the rest of the evening. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, most of the poets were highly sensitive people, as my therapist tells me. And, uh, and, Goes uh, the from Sandy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, next, you know, it wouldn't be a return in some ways for me. It's so fitting. And I'm so grateful that one of my salmon siblings is joining us today. I, you know, I always love it when one of the Salmon siblings shows up, and I'm just so grateful today that we get to hear from Eamon Linsky. It's great to see you. Great to be here. Great to be here. And to hear, um, I was just say about Carl's po poem, very good. It really was a loss, Sinead Jules, and also Dolores Reardon was also a problem for us days. Cranberry's girl. So we had a few things that weren't so good. So um, I I just got a book, book published recently um, by Salmon. Um, the, and it was launched in Seattle, actually. So I was very glad to be there with, at the AWP, meet met myself and you know, a lot of other people. Um, and I'll read the first poem from the book. And uh, it's about Dublin. So if you're not familiar, the pillar is mentioned. We used to have in the middle of Dublin, Nelson's pillar for Admiral Nelson. The IRA blew it up in 1966. I didn't really like it so much, but I don't like the spire that's there now, however, that's me. And then there's a few references to statues of Smith O'Brien O'Connell and that, those are uh, famous people. And also, at the end, it talks about Ma Malton. Malton was an artist who made pictures of Dublin in the 18th, 18th century, where the streets are all, there's no cars, so everything looks really wide and free. Anyway, this poem is called, He Walks in Several Cities. Um, Lost again, he walks in several cities. Stranger among strangers, hearing tongues that speak a language recognizable, though 
suffused with unfamiliar phrases, moving always between past and present, and then back again. He makes his way along new tarmac roads and new laid pavements, seeing cobblestones and alleyways that once had led to busy Viking wharfs. The Liffey's acrid stench, long gone, assails him, and the river at low tide reveals old mooring posts and ghosts of Guinness barges. In the narrow medieval lanes that wind through Temple Bar, he finds a maze of little Jewish garment factories instead of restaurants and pizzerias. All the weedy red derelicts he knew, replaced by gleaming chrome and glass. The junk shops, pawn shops, musty bookshops vanish. Churches open all day once, now closed. And it's the pillar, not the spire, he sees, remembering the long climb up to stand between the seagulls and the admiral to view the distant corporation housing built to clear the tenements and slums, romanticised through story, song and stage, but screened from view when Queen Victoria rode her regal cart down Sackville Street, before this pocket city of the empire crumbled into insignificant remnants of imperial grandeur and became a 1950s transit point for emigrants. Unhappy times, Yet he's nostalgic now, and even for the hardships, comforted that Smith O'Brien, O'Connell and Sir John Gray stand resolute on their pedestals as yet. Cú Cullen, still convulsed in epic struggle, Constable Sheehan's bravery remembered at Burkey. These stubborn survivors offer compass through refurbished streets, where... He is like a snail without a house on back, where he is like a book now, out of print, where he is like a refugee who cannot shed the memory of what he's lost. The more he walks the bustling streets, the more he feels a spectre, part of a Malton scene where well-dressed gentry stroll, pet dogs across a wide, almost deserted college green or trapped in some old sepia print of crowds that lure on thoroughfares of trams and drays, and he's the only figure standing hesitant, uncertain, wondering, is it safe to cross? So, thank you. That's Eamon Linsky, everyone new book from Salmon Poetry, and this is a good opportunity for me to uh, remind folks that we will be booking our new book showcases for the fall and winter seasons, up and coming, um, making notes. I'm sure Kim's making notes as you're mentioning your new books, and uh, we certainly, if you uh, would like to be in one of the new book showcases, reach out to us over uh, through our through our email. Um, uh, it's it's uh, cvlivepoetry at gmail.com and maybe Kim will be kind enough to put that in the chat for us as she's listening. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. You know, one, Eamon, one, you know, I'm waiting for a statue of Ivan Boland. That's who I'm waiting for. A statue of? Ivan Boland. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there might be one yet, you know. Um... Yeah, it's I mean, she probably would. She, yeah. she she probably turn over in the grave if there was a statue to her. Yeah. But they're all they're all male they're all male statues. Yeah. On the Cone Street. Now that I think of it, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, not, she, you know, she's not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. Something she, will have to be done. <laughs> well, thank you, and we look forward to hearing more from the book, future okay, programs. I'm so glad you're able to join us today. All my best to you this evening. Now, our next poet on our poetry barbecue, Mona Lynch here on the barbecue and 
you know, I got my wiffle ball, my bat. I'm ready to play a little bit here. If everybody comes over, we can play a little wiffle ball. It's poetry barbecue here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Mona, so great to see you today. Thank you, Sandy. It's great to be back. And thank you for mentioning Evan Boland. She opened the door for our women poets in Ireland as a very young woman. So thank you for mentioning her. Um, I have a few short poems written um, to about West Cork, which I think you do know. The first one I wrote after attending a funeral of a very special lady last weekend. It's called Homage. The fields were silent, waiting, expectant. The creatures and birds waiting too, to pay homage as we passed with Kitty. The hearse sailed high over the hawthorn, the entangled ditches thick with fuchsia, their heads bowed, accepting death as inevitable as rain. She kept her hold on life tight until her 95th year, with time, tea, and warmth for all who crossed her path. The priest officiating at the funeral laid claim to the soda bread presented as one of her gifts. He knew the taste well. She rested in Dromore Church, where her husband laid the blocks 70 years before. I was not surprised to see a white butterfly rise up from amongst the wreaths as the prayers began at the graveside in Cora Cemetery. Um, this next one is also West Cork. It's, it's Skull, where I like to spend some time. Um, uh, by the sea, where near the Fastnet Lighthouse. And this one is about the roops in the trees outside the house. I called it Rooks in Skull. From the cedars and pines, sopranos and altos, I stood at the door listening. An unexpected hush, then off again. Does it ever stop, the cawing of roops? Do they have a Toscanini in their midst? Or notice the hares or foxes who cross under their clamour? In the distance, the rhythm of the farmer, busy wrapping his harvest in black plastic, his bright yellow machine twisting tightly. Fastnet lighthouse flashes to the right, while the calm cobalt ocean caresses the shores of Hare Island, Baltimore, Shirkin, and Cape Clear. A deserted farmhouse filled with ghosts rides the horizon, their successors making waves in distant lands. Its barn rusting, sea salted winds blistering doors and windows. I too am returning to the city, leaving the raucous rooks in peace. And my last little poem is about something that had to happen here at my own house, nearer to Cork City. Uh, it's called Exposed. At 8 a.m. it started, a prototypical noise cutting through me. The time has come to part with our Californian cypresses, Lawson's guardians towering over our roof, men with chainsaws, ladders, Harnesses start ravaging my old friends of six decades. Turning away, I cannot watch them bleed and cry, hear the crash of their nodding branches. Storm Ophelia took its toll on their shallow roots, but Eunice had the last laugh and told the death knell. As the massacre continues, they look like gap-toothed hags. I sit inside, think about our daily dramas acted out under their discreet 
silent boughs, their glorious dripping cone scales, rich fragrance of parsley and welcome. Bewildered finches and wrens, muted by this sudden eviction, silence reigns, a job complete. Yes, there is light and air, but I am haunted by a keening of trees. Thank you. Oh, that's Mona Lynch, everyone. Wow, so beautiful. Such beautiful poems tonight. Oh, the three of you joining us from Ireland. Thank you so much. And um, I am hoping to be able to get to Ireland in the spring of next year. And I hope you will, I hope that, I hope you will take me to that lighthouse. Indeed. There'll always be a bed for you here. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I look forward to that day. I really, really do. Catherine, you get ready too. <laughs> uh, oh gosh. Beautiful. That's Mona Lynch, everyone. Fantastic. Well, Right now, next, we, I believe, yes, we got it right here. We're back to Pittsburgh. Oh, I had such a great time in Pittsburgh, and I look forward to my next time. And I'm really, you've been sending the most scrumptious pictures all summer long, all summer long. <laughs> Julia Magrini, everyone. Bon, bon appetito, everybody. I want to thank Cultivating Voices and the trinity of writers and community who make this Zoom possible. We have missed you. Despite intent, there are insiders in the writing population. This goes out to Don Krieger, a proficient comrade who, unlike the, ins the insiders, has done so much for the writing community. This is called Not a Fan of the Exaltation Niggle. Oh dear, I am not your fan. Your deranged explications breed unrestrained as scurrying cockroaches over yellowed paper. They trudge rank paradigms of rep, 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 reproduction and spectacle, lost pretext during your first slippery and ecstatic ejaculatory acceptance, engraved defiant blotches on the resistant page procure exasperating yield signs, the plethora of your distracting work challenges the precarious balance of social media or a frail chapbook with a flippant title, a manifestation of your plunder of literary creation. Restrain your scribbles, curtail your submissions, give your associated fledglings a chance. There is motive for diverse diversity in art, not gas bags with the highest pitch scream. Oh dear, I am not your fan. It appears the detestation niggle ate the exaltation niggle, and I overlooked it. That's just Julia McGreeny, and no truer words spoken than the heralding of what, how much Don Krieger offers to the po the poetry community not just at cultivating voices, but worldwide. He's a very humble person. He doesn't want to, he doesn't like to be in the limelight, as y'all know. And I can't say enough about how much Don does, and this program would not exist without Don. And I'm super grateful. And I'm really serious when I say that. Could not couldn't happen. And I'm talking about how he supports poets. Then there's the whole, there's the whole constellation of his own poet, of his own poetic 
oeuvre that he contributes to the world of poetry. It is, it is significant and uh, I'm very, very grateful that I know, I know a person of such integrity and, gene and poetic genius. Thank you for calling it like it is, my friend. And thanks for being here today. So great to see you. So great to see you. So great to see you. Oh, all right. A lot of love here today. Uh, I'm really very, very moved by it. And um, it's very, just very sweet. My mom is a couple rooms over, of course. She had to do some other stuff. And she said, maybe I'll pop in. And what she said to say hi to everybody. And she's kind of, she's pretty happy that we're in the same household now. So, well, now we get to hear from Lenora Good. Ah, how great to see you today, Lenora. I hope oh, you're doing well. Sandy, you have no idea how good it is to be here after this last year. I have two poems. One is short, the other is shorter. So I'll start with the shorter one first. I took a workshop yesterday on writing a modern sonnet. And we had a choice of picking a few from a list of overall themes. So here is Your Grief in 14 Lines, a persona poem. To tell you I was leaving, I waited and waited. We enjoyed the self-deception. We knew it was a lie. God put the geas on each of us. Me, he covered in a heavy blanket of ALS. To you, he gave a man you loved since before your birth. I've never understood that, but you wouldn't lie. Then God laughed. We wore our unfilled, fulfilled dreams as cloaks of warmth, hugs to wear when I no longer could. Came the day we waited for, the last day. You set your alarm, got up extra early to make me my last cup of coffee, to keep me company this day, my last day. You barely left my side, yet made room for others, held my hand for hours until I ceased. Only then did your tears flow. Only then were you alone. And I wrote this poem right after he died. And um, it has been accepted by a sacred pa passing for their uh, next newsletter. Your death rehearsed. I rehearsed your death, did you know? First, it was now and then, slowly became weekly and then nightly. Not that I wanted you to die. We both knew you would. No, I rehearsed your death so I wouldn't come apart at the seams. So I wouldn't bring shame to you, to me. It helped, I think. Oh, I still hurt and I still cry, but softly. And when you breathed your last as I held your hand and softly stroked your arm, I could barely form the words, let alone for sound out of my tear constricted throat. It's over. And then we all cried and held each other. None of us could find or define the hole that suddenly engulfed us, the hole that gave dimension to our loss, the hole drilled through our hearts. Thank you. The next time I read, I promise a happier poem. No, you don't have you. You know, there's a poet Richard Jackson, and he wrote a poem called "For a Long Time I Wanted to Write a Happy Poem," and it's like <laughs> one of the darkest things I've ever read. <laughs> and it's and it's amazing. I love Richard Jackson, and um, you know, people you bring what you are called to bring and we make no 
you make no apologies for anything you bring. You know, obviously, as long as it's within the realm of our, you know, of, of our, uh, how we're trying to hold up humanity. You, you understand what I'm saying there. So I look forward to whatever you're called to write and whatever you're called to bring the next time. Thank you. And uh, those are powerful poems. Those are powerful poems. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to see you. Well, I have to get in practice, my friends, because you know we're. I, I want to get to as many waiting list folks as we can, and I'll get. I'll get tighter. I'm a little out of practice, but our final poet for the featured the features for today. Then we go to the waiting list to hear some bonus barbecue poetry. Linda Olson Graham. And Linda has just been out there on the edge of <laughs> the world, on the edge of the world, out there on the Cape, a, a place, another place. I, I can't wait to come and meet you in person. Oh, I really look forward to it. I, I can't wait. I don't just, I don't know that it's going to be. Well, you're not I so far away I might be able to make it now. this fall, but I don't know. But I yeah, can't. You're I'm not so, so far away now. I'm so looking forward to it. And yeah. in doing your work for the planet, um, truly, the your, 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 your very pure, clear, spirited work for the planet. Thank you. Well, uh, things are moving following. along, and that's exciting. Hmm. Well, so what I actually, today? I can give a shout out back to you about something major that's happened. Um, Michael Anthony Ingram, who has cult, has um, quintessential listening poetry online radio. I love him. Heard me on one of your shows when I was featured. He invited me to be his hour guest last September. The next, you know, the next day, a Nigerian poet contacted me and said, we're writing about the same thing. And we started FaceTiming. And Zoom, in the old definition of the word, <laughs> long story short, um, a book he was about to publish on Amazon titled Save the Earth starts off with 13 pages of my poetry in my bio. Yeah, isn't that just kind of exciting. And I have a niece um, who's willing to help fund my first book, which was copyright in 2015, I think, titled Earth, Ocean, Heavens, a mini guidebook to aid humanity in entering the new age. So that's in the, in the works. And it's fun to be on your show. Everybody's poetry has been so amazing. And I just send praises to you and Kim and Don and you know, you must feel the beaming over the, <laughs> through the atmosphere from where I am to where you each are, because there's a lot of love for what you've, for the poetry that you support, Sandy, so eloquently. You know, you're really, you're a joy for us to be around. So what better gift than to have that go back and forth? You know, with every poet you interact with, it's, you can tell that each person is having a wonderful time. So I, I applaud you for that. So yeah, I would I imagine everybody would. So I'm just gonna share, I'm gonna share some lines from a couple of pieces that are, there's so much going on on the planet. Um, in Northeastern University's sacred space, some lines I wrote, it was, um, I was listening to a talk on Care of the Soul by Thomas More. How sweet is silence having quiet mind. There's a point in each of our lives where we move away from our palatial Eden out into the world. Suffering has been used as a start to the path. There's a time when one is confronted with things as they are and one holds one's vision. That is responding to the whispers before they become shouts. When large things happen, example, September 11th, we need time to absorb the shock. Self-nurture, settle in the self. Be not too ambitious to move away from the shock. In the traditions, we need to osmotically absorb. The great way is not difficult if there's no 
picking and choosing. Dharma is the way things are. Be present enough not to deny reality as it is. Reality is our teacher. Events are our teacher. So that's um, part of what I'd like to share. And then some of these notes, it's actually the 30th anniversary. Oh, oh thanks. Um, it's actually the 30th anniversary of an interesting experience I went through um, that was huge with 30 pages of capital use and it ended up being not a big deal. It just was, it was really fun actually in the overall and it's profound to be able to say that. So I'll share some of the lines that were written within the first couple of months, which is exactly now 30 years ago. Silence is a way to move towards essence. Love is not something that we do. It's like the breath. Peace will come and with it many reflections of the light. To be deep is ultimate surrender. Live in the confluency of life. The whole of heaven can be contained in each one of us in every act we do. The sweetness of the kingdom of heaven visits each one of us. The function of a human being is to take things that are intrinsically beautiful and turn them into heaven. Immortality is that we become a memory in the thought of God. When one becomes closer to being a mystic, one leaves meaning behind and lives more in the moment. A mystic lives in the interiority of life. We are each cells in God's body. Worship illuminates destiny. We're all facets of the diamond, which is God, each of us reflecting light in our own way. Swim and dance in the beauty of life. Thank you for lifting the veil from the earth's eyes. I think that's what's going on right now with all the crisis that's going on. So many people are waking up on such a deeper level because of what we're collectively being confronted with as a human race of people. So the next line is swim and dance in the beauty of life. Well, that I read that already. Every time a cell becomes more awakened within us, I really look at it as the light, you know, that doesn't really have a denomination or, a, you know, it just, it just is very simply the light that if we can all hold light in our hearts and look out at creation, I mean, I read a book years ago. The I, I mean, I still read it, but read it. But I was really involved with the Urantia book years ago, and it just talks about millions and billions of stars and planets and levels that we we go to from Earth. And you know, it's whatever one's belief is in. It's just to hold positive thoughts. That's really the basis of my writing. So it's I'll close with saying, um, please hold the thought with me that peace on Earth and calmer weather patterns, the end of terrorist attacks and insights to cure and eradicate the pandemic can easily happen in a moment or two of silence in enough of the collective mind. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry my picture's not showing us something happened. Yeah, we see we see a picture of you, but I- Yeah, I can't get the camera to work for some it's all good. It's all good. It's good. Yeah, it's good. It's all good. It's all good. That Thanks. is Linda Olson Graham. Thank you so much for, first of all, sharing the good news about how your work is progressing and moving forward. And um, also just, again, you know, today, I'm just so struck by the clarity of poetic purpose and spirit and artistry and creativity and that the synergy that you all have brought today. Um, and, you know, I always say to, I always used to say to my students and I still believe, and I believe this, of course, the rising tide lifts all boats. And I, I just really, really feeling that today from all of you, like, like we're just creating this swell and, 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 and if, if we can just continue to do that, um, there's a lot of power in what can what can move forward in the face of in the face of the disasters that we also must confront. So, you know, I tell you all to keep writing at the end of every program and I mean it. 
and I mean it for all the things that for all the for all the things that Linda shared with us. Thank you so much, Linda. And again, uh, look forward to seeing you soon. And peace and love to you. Peace and love to you, Sandy. Thanks. Now we are to our waiting list, and ah, oh, I think we're gonna we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it, my friends. One poem a piece. And then we'll close out with some announcements. I'm so grateful on our first, oh, you know, our first poet today in the, on the wait list for one poem is Love Infinite, which I love. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so infinitely grateful to be here. Um, one poem. <laughs> uh so hard to choose you'll get, you'll get you'll you'll get more in the future don't worry. <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't worry um so i am gonna do something where i'm ba basically i have two different poems but i'm reading them as one so you still getting a two for one you just i we just didn't, we, we didn't hear that we didn't hear that that's all right okay good 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 okay <laughs> um so i'm to, i'm gonna name this of they've got the whole world in their hands in love with the world that I know loves me back. I have the whole wide world in my hands. She has the whole wide world in her hands. Why should they fear falling in love with that in which is themselves? She was goddess and God simultaneously knowing whomever she loved was herself and deserved it. And whomever, and whomever she lost was also deserving of another her, another them, more fitting. She was everywhere, everything, all at once, but loved one at a time, attention focused and devoted to one subject, one projection, one mirror at a time, not because she couldn't love more, but because this is the way she slash they preferred to experience love. This is the way she slash they loved to give love. This is the way she slash they knew to nurture best. And any receiver of her affections knew it was one in a million. Her love was one of one. Their love was extraordinary, a gift they called unanimously the absolute, the eternal, the infinite. And others called it God. I could be anywhere in the world, anywhere in the universe, but I'm here now. When so many other timelines exist, I'm here with you in this dimension. I am self-absorbed with a God complex. Why be with you when I can be with me? Why share my life with you when the life the person I must be to be loved by you, liked by you, the version of myself you tolerate can accept being around, aren't completely disgusted by, isn't me at all. It's always love people for who they are. And I wonder who will love me unconditionally for all that I am. It's always love people for who they are until they are someone like me, mean, slutty, possessive, self-involved, self-devoted, isolationist, needy, little girl, child, think she's God, only believing in herself and her ability to be everyone she sees. When I remember that, I know that whatever I'm feeling is not true. I'm loved unconditionally. Everyone is obsessed with me regardless of if they can show it or not. What are y'all waiting for? Love me. Love me unconditionally. Thank you, that is the poem. What are they all waiting for? Well, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> there it is yes there it is 
I think that's what everybody's waiting for themselves. That's right. We're, we're all waiting for ourselves to show up, aren't we? Yes, yes. In all the different various ways that that we can. And to just love and accept ourselves the yes. way we want another person to do that, to not feel like, oh, we're not doing us right. I just want to say that everybody here, that you are doing you right. Mm. And please keep doing you, whatever that is. And know that whatever it is, even if it seems like no one likes it, that they're obsessed. <laughs> uh, love Infinite, I think you should be the host of this show, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come back anytime. I look forward to it next time, my friend. I'm I would love to. I'll see you all next time. As we'll, well see, we'll see you very soon. Yes. Thank you so much. You know, I love that we have Love Infinite as our first. You know, we have only a few people on the on the on the on the um on the waiting list. And it's just so perfect. We start with love and then we move to another type of love, and her name is. Catherine Ronan. <laughs> <laughs> and this, as it turns out, is a, a sort of love poem. So it's got a bit of Gaelic mythology in it as well. It's called Feathers. In the market bar, you fill my forehead with tarring, shaving, exorcism sticking to the roof of your mouth spitting stories of St. Kevin's. God, you are exciting. Sweeney turned mad after war stamped his eye, strayed in nakedness before trees embraced him. I eagle you again, cup your warm swallows laugh. Trust this crow I, I will feather you home. Oh yeah, that's it. There you go. There it is. There it is. That's Catherine Ronan, everyone. That joining us from her exquisite wall in Cork. Eighteen. The exquisite wall is real. Built in eighteen ninety five. I love that wall so much, and I missed it so much. And I'm grateful to see you in front of the wall. Doing what you do so well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my friends. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you, Sandy and Don and Kim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to, you know, look, the waiting list has been all about love. And the poem I chose also was a love poem that was a poem from, you know, this, this book that just, you know, keeps going, keeps doing what it does. and. Uh, Boats for Women, and it's a poem that I wrote one August when I was in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was actually right outside of Kim Ports Parsons' apartment building, truth be told, and so these flowers outside her apartment inspired this poem, and I'm forever, forever grateful for that, and obviously for Kim's friendship and her poetry and just every single thing that she is. Um, yeah, so this is called Sonnet, we'll come, and we come back to sonnets again, you know, the sonnets. Um, sonnet before and after everything collides. Three hushed nights, the moon has not wavered from my window, round as breath just captured against winter glass, the light luminescent with moonflowers, that August night they craned their necks to rapture before their mouths flooded the garden's uninhabited dark. In three measured days, I would meet you, but the moonflowers could wait for no one, could not risk the shame of a missed curfew, so they opened without you. I am still trying to imitate chance, since I've never been clock enough to know how the night wants me to open. It is always late. The moon pulls me toward another unknown time. I square my shoulders to the frosted questions, the pulse of your name, 
your body's nocturnal shine. Well, what a barbecue, poetry barbecue we've had today, my friends. You know, I'm ready to just light all the marshmallows on fire, um, douse everything in iced tea, blow all the bubbles in the universe. And it was Kim who said, let's do a barbecue. Yeah, good idea, Kim. I wanna thank each and every one of our readers today and for joining us on the open mic, the barbecue open mic, the opening of our fall season, our summer into fall for today. And if, I hope I leave no one out and I might because I wasn't taking very good notes at all. So I was just so swept up. The barbecue today, we heard from Ken Birch and Tweedy, Marcella Raymond, Alexandra Zarapalu, Joanne James, Harvey Soss, Eamon Linsky, Mona Lynch, Lenora Good, Linda Olson Graham, Love Infinite, Catherine Ronan, and poem from Sandy. Folks, I want to just so heartedly deep this from the heart, say thank you for being here today on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And those of you who are now watching the recording, you obviously see that we had a beautiful, beautiful reunion together. I am been so swept up in the reading that all my notes that I had just flew out the window and what I was gonna say at the end of the program but I, I, I mostly wanted to remind you of a few things, which is we will be returning next week with our opening to our September program. It's our Poets Focus. And the word for September is schooling, schooling. And you can take that. Schooled. School, oh, schooled, excuse me. Schooled. I it didn't sound quite right coming out it's of my a, Yeah. School. You want to say anything? No. No, you don't. Okay. Schooled. So you watch for the poster, the beautiful poster. Come back next week, share some poetry around that prismatic theme. On September 10th, of course, we return with our new books showcase. It's 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 it is shaping up to be a very amazing prismatic showcase as well. And we have Edward O'Dwyer from the Poet Laureate of Limerick will be joining, will uh, be joining us. Maeve. Yeah, Maeve O'Reilly. Maeve O'Reilly McKenna will be joining us as well. I believe we'll have Caitlin Krause and we've got a fourth in the May in the works. So that's our new book showcase coming up on September 10th. September 17th, of course, join us back here for our wild card open mic. You bring you 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 bring the poetry. I bring the deck of cards and we make magic together for in in for for all. And I want to also now give a, a, a encourage you all to mark your calendars for September 24th. We will be co-sponsoring, uh, collaborating with Headmistress Press, and we will be hosting uh, a tribute to the poet Minnie Bruce Pratt, one of our members here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, who passed in, um, who passed in late June, and we'll be having a tribute reading to her and Leslie Feinberg, uh, her partner of many, many years. It is, um, I do not have the list of readers from Risa at this time, but it, it, it's a beautiful cavalcade of poets who are gonna be joining us on the show to um, share some of Minnie Bruce's works and, and remembrances of her life and, and her life with Leslie Feinberg. Um, and I will also say that it is possible that her sons or maybe one of her sons will be joining us on the program as well. Um, we've actually reached out to them. So I hope you will be able to join us on September 24th. That's our, our you know, our 
off Sunday, but we wanted to um, take take full full advantage of this opportunity to to uh, honor two two humans that really have done so so much for social justice and poetry, uh, like on this planet. So that's September twenty fourth, my friends. A reminder that we are setting up the fall and winter seasons of the new book showcases. And because we don't do them as often as we used to, um, we do our best to get in as many of our members that are bringing out new books within a year of their publication. Do reach out to us. I am on my email now, uh, whereas I really haven't been very much for the past two months. So apologies if you've been trying to reach me for any Cultivating Voices Live Poetry business. Um, but we look forward to those second Sundays where we are able to feature your new books. Uh, and uh, yeah, also if you, uh, the final thing I'd like to say too is I was saying this in the pre-show is that, you know, I live in New England now and um, for some of you, you live in states that are very close to me. And if you'd like to, host a program live out of your own poetic, you know, magic castle or whatever, and uh, have us do the program from here, from, from, your, from, from your magic, contact me and maybe I can make a little road trip and, and we can, uh, you know, we can do the show together. It's, 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 it's really been fun to do some with, uh, with some of you live. And so I look forward to more of that it's really fun to be on location. So I'll try to make as many of those happen. And as I said, it's a genuine invitation. Reach out and I'll see if I can make something happen if you care to do that. Well, finally, my friends, it's, it's what I always say at the end of the program. And it's uh, I've never felt it more than I really felt it today. Um, and I feel that every Sunday we're together, which is, you know, your work is so important. So please, you know, in the spirit of what Love Infinite was talking about, Take exquisite care of yourselves. Continue to take exquisite care of yourselves. Take additional exquisite care of your beloveds, of your beloveds. And that means the ones that are in our physicality and the ones that are elsewhere. You know, just take care of all the beloveds, all the beloveds. And just keep doing what you're doing. Keep writing those remarkable, remarkable poems that only you can write. We need them more than ever. We need your voices more than ever. Well, that's our program for today here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm Sandy you know, and your host. It's been such a, such a fantastic, I feel so well fed in this barbecue today. Kim is also, yes, yes. And uh, I look forward to seeing you the next time I can see you here in our Zoom screens and even better if I get to see you in person sometime soon. And whenever you're able to arrive, we're grateful for you being here. So have a great rest of your evening, afternoon, morning, whatever time zone you are in. And have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Be well, my friends. You too, Sandy. Thank you, everybody. There's Bonnet. Take care. Thanks, Sandy. More soon. Bye bye. Hey, see you. Bye. Yeah, good to see you. Bye. Bye. Bravo. Yeah, lots of love. Bravo. Here's my, here's my heart. There it is. <laughs>